Hello everyone, I'm Deacon Pedro and welcome back to our continued series during this time of pandemic, Faith in a Time of Crisis. Today we travel to Alberta and I'm very happy to welcome the Most Reverend Richard Smith, Archbishop of Edmonton, to the program. Archbishop, welcome, welcome. It's so good to see you. Deacon Pedro, great to see you. Thanks for the invitation. Um, for people who are not familiar with your Archdiocese, can you tell us a little bit about the Archdiocese of Edmonton? Sure, sure. It, uh, it represents the central part of Alberta. It's about 80,000 square kilometers. We've got about 120 churches in that area, a mixture of urban and rural. Um, prairies, Rockies, it's all there. Uh, we've got about 200 Catholic schools. We've got 20 some healthcare facilities. Very large organization dedicated to uh, care of the needy, Catholic Social Services. Mm -hmm. um, we estimate about 450,000 Catholics, I think mostly centered here in um, Edmonton, which is uh, in the greater metropolitan area, is about 1.3 million people, I think now. So that in, in broad strokes, that's, that's the Archdiocese. Right. Um, and for people who are not in Alberta, how has this pandemic affected you in the province? Oh, it's having a it's having a tremendous, tremendous impact. Um, quite apart from the health factor, and everybody is going through the medical restrictions just like everywhere else. We don't have the same degree of lockdown that we do have in other parts of the country. So, for example, our churches can still be open. We're doing just live stream mass, but people can go in through the day and pray. Okay. Can go in through the day and have their confessions heard. Um, provided that we stay within the restrictions with all the social distancing and the limit to 15 people at a maximum, so on and so forth. Uh, what is particularly troubling here, of course, is the impact on the economy because uh, it's a it's a double, triple whammy here. It's really remarkable with the total collapse in oil prices that is leaving hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people out of work which means that even as we do come out of the pandemic itself, we've got a very, very long economic recovery that's facing the province here. So uh, there's an awful lot that our civic and medical authorities have to juggle with here. And yeah. really we're doing our best as a church to work with them, to walk with them, to accompany them through with our cooperation. And above all, of course, with our prayers. It's a very, yeah. very difficult time for people here. Yeah, I do want to get back to that because I think that the uh, the economic fallout for for most people is going to be much worse than the people that were actually affected directly their health with the virus. Um, but I wanted to ask you about the so you said that churches are still open. Was that a decision that was made as as a province from the government? Was there any conversations between yourself or other church leaders and the government to to figure out how that was going to work? Um, yeah, the, um, no, the cooperation and the communication with the government here is, is, is good. I mean, we've got some contacts, people that I can call upon as necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have, oh, it would be a few weeks ago now, time is all falling together, a province-wide uh, teleconference with the chief medical officer, the minister of health, and with the premier himself. Okay. With all the religious leaders that wanted to be part of this uh, teleconference. There was about 380 of us, I think, that were part, took part in that. And the message that, that we all received was the recognition on the part of the government and on the part of the chief medical officer that faith does play a very vital role in people's lives. Their connection with their respective churches or synagogues or mosques is, is very, very critical for them. And, and I do remember the chief medical officer saying that she recognizes that faith and people's connection with their churches or temples, or whatever, um, is an essential service. Has to be delivered differently now in these circumstances. But as a result, um, what they have said to us is respect the limits in terms of assembly. Right. Whether or not a church would stay open, they really left that to the religious authorities themselves. So that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. Not, 
it's been good. And so the, the bishops here have said, well, what I've said particularly in Edmonton is if, uh, if a church has been in the habit of staying open, not all can, but mm -hmm. if a church has been in the habit of staying open, that do so. Follow all the restrictions. Make sure the hours that you will be open are clearly communicated when you'll be available for counseling or for confessions or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so by and large, that's what we've been able to do, thanks be to God. So, so, and you said that the limit was 15, because in other provinces, 15, it's yeah. five. Um, 15 here right now. So people can have Sunday Mass then, if as long as there aren't more than 15 people there. Is that... Well, we've been a little bit more particular on that one. So the way we've been doing the Mass is probably the same as it's been done across the country, and that's through the live stream. Mm -hmm. Because that limitation on 15 is still meant to exclude anybody who's been traveling, anybody who's at risk, so senior citizens and so on. It would also mean uh, a monitoring, a policing, if you will, about making sure only that number could, and that becomes very, very difficult, yeah, and very, very tense. And you could easily see yourself in a position where some would want to come to the church if they thought mass was being celebrated, only to be turned away. So we didn't want to get into that terrible situation. We just said, we will do the same outreach for everybody, the live stream mass, and invite people to participate uh, through their computer, through the television or whatever, uh, making the spiritual community and so on. Added right. to that, of course, is the fact, and we have to get, we're going to be in dialogue with some infectious disease specialists about this. The whole sense of how the distribution of Holy Communion itself might, it's, might in itself be a way of transmitting the virus. And so we have to look at that really, really carefully okay. so that those risks are mitigated. So in these very uncertain uh, mm -hmm. circumstances, we felt the best way to balance everybody's safety with the fact that we still are a Eucharistic community, mm -hmm. take advantage of everything that the tradition offers us in order to make that available and bring it together. So where we landed was on the, the live stream mass. Right, which, which which I guess is what everybody else is doing. What's different with you is that your churches are still open, so people can go and pray. Um, uh, I suppose they can go and, and celebrate the Sacrament of Reconciliation with an yes. appointment. If, yeah. 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 So a, a parish priest might say, okay, here are the hours, you know, in which you can come in. Mm -hmm. It will be different for many people because we ruled out the use of the confessional. You just cannot have the social distancing and the right. preventative measures using a confessional. So reconciliation room with the proper distancing and everything else. Mm -hmm. Have you heard how this might be affecting funerals or weddings, for example? Well, uh, yeah, funerals, they can proceed in this sense. I mean, if you're able to gather with a, with a maximum of 15 people, same with weddings. Now, what we're saying here is that has to be without the Eucharist for all those reasons that I just explained, mm -hmm. uh, but it can happen. So funerals are proceeding. In fact, I just pres uh, presided at one, um, the father of one of our priests died. So we had a, a funeral, yeah. but it can. It was just um, uh, the priest's mother, the, the widow, and his brother. So three of us and a camera. So we were able to live stream it to family that was elsewhere in the world. Not the best, obviously, but it was the best that we could do. Um, weddings, some weddings are still taking place within those restrictions, but many couples are making the decision to postpone until such time as they can have more guests present and so on. Yeah, exactly. Now I know that you, as well as most priests, are, are uh, experimenting or, or trying the, the, their 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 hand at doing everything online. You're very good on camera. I know that you're you have lots of experience doing video messages. Are you finding that you're having to communicate a lot more through well, very much. video and the technology? Very much, yeah. Well, one of the things that I and the other bishops and all the other, all the priests are, are recognizing is the need to communicate because of the need to connect. Right? As mm -hmm. a people of faith, we are a people who connect with one another. We're accustomed to being together uh, when we can't, especially if people live alone, if people do have some health conditions, they live alone, um, it's very, very easy to feel separated, uh, at risk, perhaps forgotten. So we want really to find different ways to reach out and to connect. So 
Uh, yes, they've asked me to do a number of different video messages, which I've done to seniors or healthcare workers or education professionals. Um, other groups have done a lot of instruction through video messaging, through on indulgences, Marian consecration, how to celebrate the Eucharist in this kind of a setting and so on. Um, priests in their parishes, they're, they're doing great, great work. A lot of them can be very, very creative. I heard of one parish where it's Fridays with Father, you know, some kind of a video chat for anybody who wants to participate. Yeah. Another priest is doing video chat rooms, I guess you'd call it, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, for anybody, especially youth that might want to be part of that through video, they can connect with their schools. A lot of wonderful outreach. Uh, one of the more moving things that I found among the priests was we put together a team. We, we put out a call. We wanted a team of priests who would be prepared to go to anoint someone who might be on the verge of dying from the COVID-19. And the, the uptake was instant. Yes, of course we'll go. So we went through some training and preparation, how to put on the mask, how to do the, the proper donning and doffing of the equipment, what could be taken into a patient's room or not um, for the anointing, for giving viaticum and these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, so to have the priests ready, uh, without any hesitation to step up to the plate in a situation that might be a considerable risk to themselves, I found very edifying and very, very encouraging. Yeah, well, it's not just it's not just our parishes of priests. Lots of good stuff happening. Phone trees in yeah. parishes where they're reaching out, want to connect with people. But I'm finding too that all of our Catholic institutions are really rallying. Everybody okay. wants to reach out and help. So. We've got a vast network, a complicated network of healthcare facilities. So obviously there, you've got the, the designated heroes, if you will, of the whole pandemic, the frontline healthcare workers. But volunteers in those areas are also rallying. They're making hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of masks for healthcare workers when they leave the hospital and they still want to wear a special mask that doesn't have to be the medical type. Wow. They're going home. Or, so they're stepping up there. Nursing homes, continuing care, we have a lot of those. Yeah. And there the pain is particularly acute when families are separated, right, from one another, can't go in and visit. And so I heard of one facility, a continuing care facility in the south of the province, Medicine Hut, where they arranged for all family members to have a vehicle parade, if you will. So they decorated all their cars, drove through, through the town and in front of the facility, honking the horn, stopping and waving. So they brought some of the residents out to the degree that they could, which was a real, real shot in the arm for them, you know. Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, Catholic Social Services, right? They they work with us in well, many, many ways, but um, mm -hmm. they are the ones who help us manage our refugee immigrant settlement service here. Okay. And so if you can imagine refugees, immigrants coming in already having to deal with the complexities of coming to a new country, new culture. Now, in addition, having to manage all of this pandemic mm -hmm. uh, issue and everything that goes with it. So working with those people to help them understand the medical system, how to navigate it at a time like this can be a real challenge, but they're doing it. Abuse in homes, violence right now can be on the uptake because of all the yeah. tension and so they've got an elder abuse service where they're really ramping that up to reach out to the lonely and, and the elderly, make sure they're safe. Our schools are really rallying with all the things that the teachers are doing through video yeah. to connect with their students. In many ways, they're, they're looking for different ways they can continue to feed families that are hungry, that are poor, that whose kids might get a meal through the school. But now what they're doing, they're reversing the dynamic and they're putting the meals together and they're going out and uh, somehow finding ways to deliver to the families. The school will set up its own food bank and so on. Those are just a few examples, Pedro, but it, it's very heartwarming and encouraging to see how the Catholic community is really standing up and saying, there's a lot we gotta do, we gotta connect, people are in need, how are we gonna do it? And I'm sure there's a lot more creative, effective things that are happening. Yeah, you know, it where, sounds, it sounds like I was going to ask you how you're if you're feeling encouraged by the Catholic community, but it sounds like, like oh, for sure, for sure. and they're sustaining Very you. Sure. Um, I know I was going to mention uh, when you said about having to do video messages. I even saw that you did you did one in sign language. So there's a whole 
other community there that needs to be reached as well through 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 signs. Um, and ask you to do that. I've got a, a bit of a history of working with uh, the deaf community. It goes back to my days as a priest in Halifax. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a small Catholic deaf community here that I've maintained contact with. We have a deaf priest. Mm -hmm. um, he's away in studies right now, but he, on behalf of some of them, had asked if I would put that video together. I said, well, sure, glad to do it. So I'm glad I was able to do that too. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's, uh, it's, it's a great way. I've, I've heard that, I mean, it's not ideal circumstances, but the amount of people that are being reached that maybe we're not reaching under normal circumstances is... Well, uh, one very interesting example of that is uh, in our inner city here in Edmonton, we have a parish that for years has been dedicated to the First Nations peoples. Mm -hmm. So the pastor there, who himself speaks Cree, he uh, does a daily live stream mass as well as one on the weekend. But he was telling me not too long ago that the uptake on that is enormous. He's getting, even on a daily basis, thousands of people that are linking into this wow. from across the prairie provinces. It's uh, it's a wonderful outreach to the indigenous peoples that he's able to affect simply by putting a camera in front of himself and saying the mass. You know? mm -hmm. So, no, it's not. It's not ideal. We don't want this. We want to be together in our churches. But um, we trust that when these limitations come to us, the Lord can turn it to the good. And if we, if we take a look at what's unfolding, we can see that, boy, there's a lot of people that maybe are being reached through this that maybe had not been reached before, and they're hearing the gospel and they're hearing right. the message of hope at a time when we really need to hear that mm -hmm. unique message of hope that can only come from the gospel. Yeah, I know, I know. There's always there's always opportunities, and and God has a way to make all things new. Um, there's a rumor that. In your archdiocese, you're considering reinstating public masses. What can you tell us about that? Well, well at, at this stage, what we've done, uh, everybody's got to be looking ahead, and we all want to be reinstating public celebration of mass. Of course, that's not unique to me or to this province. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is something where the circumstances are so complex. We need to think this through carefully. So. What we've done and what we just recently announced is not the reinstitution of the public celebration of mass, but uh, the establishment of a task force to study this. All right. And what we would need to study would be timelines. When would we do this? And that can only be determined in close dialogue with the government. It's, it has now introduced its own relaunch plan, mm -hmm. which is going to unfold over months. Right? So at what point do we fit in with that and how. And so that's part of the dynamic. We also have to look at, all right, how do we continue to do social distancing within the church? How, what's that going to mean in terms of what spacing we mark off and so on? Yeah. The really critical point obviously is going to be the distribution of Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. um, if it is possible that the trans, that doing this might transmit the virus, what do we need to do in order to make sure that does not happen? Mm -hmm. How do we sanitize? How do we protect? I don't know the answers to that. I know that would but, be, but we're, we're, our task force will have as part of it, obviously, some infectious disease specialists that can look at what we would like to do and can give us advice as to whether or not that would work, that would be yeah. something that can uh, unfold in a way that doesn't promote the spread of the virus or if it's something we need to avoid. Um, lots to work out there, but we'll, we'll work at it and knock heads together and see what we can come up with. Yeah, yeah, lots to consider there. Um, you mentioned earlier about the, the financial fallout or the economic fallout that's affecting the whole province, not just Edmonton. Um, I can imagine that that is also affecting parishes. I know it's happening in, in, in other uh, places where parishes are closed. They're not having the donations or that they normally get. Um, some parishes have had to lay, lay some of their staff off, um, some chanceries even. I, I don't know, how has that affected well, you and your it's Very, very painful. Um, but the donations are dropping for sure. And we're breaking all the appeals that we can using um, the 
communication technologies available to us. We've ensured that every one of our parish websites has a donate button and we've been sending out letters and I've been doing video, another video message was on that. Yeah. Um, encouraging people to donate. But the fact remains that the income, the receipts just are not there the way that they have been. And we rely entirely on those donations, which and means what we are able to prepare to pay for people. Yeah. Sorry. To sorry. sorry. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, because I think that a lot of us think, understand how that affects the parishes, but maybe people don't understand how that would even affect your office, the chancery. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, no, it does it, it dramatically because as in, as in most uh, diocesan operations, the revenue that comes here is a certain percentage of the revenue that is collected in the parishes. So to, to the degree that revenues drop off in the parishes, they will drop off here too. And because of that, um, we've had to lay off a significant number of people, a temporary layoff, taking advantage of all the government programs because I wanted to make sure that our people are still secure, as, as secure as they can be, even if they have to make this sacrifice at one point. So at, at this point, so we're able to take advantage of those programs and and at, at least try to ensure at least 80 percent of, of what they had been accustomed to receiving they can for the next number of months. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, it's uh, it's a very, very painful thing to go through. Yeah. Uh, uh, we it all came into effect for us just last week and a lot of tears, a lot of sighs, uh, because yeah. these are your colleagues that you've come to love and, and yeah. really work with uh, conjointly in ministry, sharing their love right. for the gospel and wanting to, to spread it and mm -hmm. to see them have to walk away is really challenging. Yeah. Um, anyway, there's where we are. And, yeah, and just the whole thing to, to the Lord and his goodness and his providence and yeah. try to get back to some kind of degree of normalcy before too too long. And if the government, I mean, it's comforting to know that at least at, at, a, at a provincial level, the government has declared that, that churches are essential. So are some of those sus subsidies that apply to other industries or other businesses, do they apply to the parishes or to your office? Um, some do and some don't. Um, I want to be just clear. I hope I didn't miscommunicate. There's been no formal decree on the part of the government that this is essential service. That was a comment from the, the chief medical officer. But nevertheless, I think that's a sentiment that, that would be held by many in government yeah. leadership here in the province. A lot of the employment programs, provincial, federal, yes, uh, we're able to take advantage of. I think some other charitable grants that might be available for some nonprofit organizations may not apply to houses of worship. Okay. The details of what programs apply to which that escapes me right now, but uh, there is some support. Mm -hmm. I can't uh, uh, stop thinking that this is an opportunity for you to to do a whole other season of uh, nothing more beautiful <laughs> online. <laughs> well, I'll be happy to get you guys back here one way or the other, whether it's in person or online or whatever. You this know, I, I mean, Eve to nothing more beautiful. Every life matters. That was all really, that was really, really good. Yeah. This whole, this whole thing though, whether it's a program like that or any other way, it really underscores the need to communicate. And it really underscores Deacon Pedro, the nature of who we are. Mm -hmm. If we're church, we are a people who ipso facto communicate. Yeah. And we reach out and communicate with the most important message ever. Life, faith, hope, joy in Jesus Christ. There's an awful lot I think we need to ponder and what are the lessons that we're learning in all of this. Um, but ch uh, chief among them has to be the centrality of a communications ministry that takes advantage of every opportunity, every technique possible to get the message out there because there's nothing more beautiful, there's nothing more important out there than this gospel of our Lord. Yeah, I was going to ask you about lessons, and, and that is one that I have been hearing from a lot of other uh, bishops across the country, that we have to proclaim the word and use any any way we can, any means possible, and we're learning, uh, we're being forced uh, to do it this way. Um, I think, too, Deacon Pedro, in terms of lessons learned, this is something that we can all reflect upon, I think, and I'm just starting to a little bit. 
uh, it would be important, I think, to invite all of us, I think all of society, even more importantly, to reflect upon our experience because what has been arising naturally in the global response to the pandemic are some key fundamental principles at the heart of Catholic social doctrine. Mm -hmm. People are just allowing to arise spontaneously and naturally within themselves, mm -hmm. uh, showing that our social doctrine, it's not something we pull out of the air, but it, it really is grounded in the nature of the human person, the human person who has this dignity, created the image and likeness of God, and created for communion. So we've seen the whole world acknowledge the supremacy of life, the dignity of the human person, the common responsibility, the shared responsibility we have for a common good, the centrality of the family. Mm -hmm. A lot of families are really discovering the joy right now of being together and learning to live together again. Mm -hmm. um, solidarity, the universal destination of goods, I think is another one, especially when we hear, I think it was just this weekend when the Holy Father said, well, if we're back, um, developing a vaccine, we're gonna find one, let's make sure it's available for everybody. Huh? So these are principles that the church has taught for generations. Mm -hmm. But now people are seeing it for themselves, even without recognizing it might be the heart of Catholic social doctrine. I think there's an op evangelical opportunity there that we need to ponder and take yeah. advantage of. Absolutely. There's lots, lots to consider there. Much. Much. Thank you. Thank you for that, Archbishop Richard Smith. It's been so good to see you and to, to hear your words of inspiration and encouragement today. Great, great to see you and talk to you, Deacon Pedro. Yeah, keep up the great work that you guys are doing too. You know, it's wonderful. Thank you. It. Thank you. Archbishop Richard Smith is the Archbishop of Edmonton, um, and he joined us from his home office uh, in Edmonton. Uh, that's all for today. Please continue to visit our website, saltandlighttv.org, for more videos and articles during this pandemic. And remember, most importantly, continue to keep the faith during this time of crisis.